please join in the call to worship. You are welcome to recite the words in the bold type on the screen. Love calls us to beware, to keep alert, to pay attention. Evil will react when the kingdom draws near. Like sheep among wolves, the truth tellers will be preyed upon. The healers will be ridiculed. The ones who raise life from death will be handed over. In knowledge of evil's ways, we watch and we take action. We protect each other. We examine our hearts. We trust the spirit to give us courage. The faithful one will uphold the righteous and deliver us from evil. Let God's holy presence come and manifest among us. Would you join us in singing our gathering hymn? The words will appear on the screen in just a moment.
Good morning and welcome to First Church in Seattle. I'm so glad you are a part of this community today. Uh, whether you're in Seattle or part of the Seattle um, uh, exiles uh, who have uh, left but continue to worship with us, or someone new entirely, whether this is your first Sunday with us or your 50th or however many, I'm very glad to spend this time with you today in worship as we celebrate our student ministries and as we celebrate the ways in which we can support and care for each other in this time of uncertainty, violence, and upheaval. Today is Youth Sunday, Student Ministry Sunday, where the children and youth have taken over uh, much of the worship service. There are several announcements uh, that you uh, will see later on in the worship service of different opportunities going on. I will lift up one, which is uh, that after worship today, there is a uh, uh, there is a after the service. Uh, conversation on Zoom uh, where you can uh, join together with other church members or other uh, folks in our community. Talk a little bit about the service, about uh, what impacted you, uh, what learnings you're taking from it, uh, what transformation you're going to continue to work on in your heart uh, all throughout the week. Be a great time of moderated conversation. So uh, look for the Zoom link at the end of the worship service. Uh, likewise, uh, in a few weeks, there is a great uh, opportunity uh, for a lunch and learn. Uh, I, I know lunch and learns usually it means that we all have lunch together when we learn about something in this virtual world. We're doing a little different where uh, we invite you to make lunch after church and then get together uh, in two weeks of, uh, in a conversation. And then I'll, I'll invite the Church and Society Committee to let us know what that's all about now. Good morning. The Church and Society Committee would like you to know about another meaningful movie from First Church. Do you want to tell us about it? Sure. Uh, we're going to present by Zoom the award-winning documentary entitled Suppressed, The Fight to Vote. And one of the advantages of Zoom is we can bring an expert in uh, from Virginia. Her name is Andrea Miller. And she is the co-founder of Reclaim Our Vote, which is a nonpartisan campaign to get voters of color registered to vote in such, particularly in such states such as Georgia, Alabama, Virginia, uh, Texas, and Mississippi, where states that have been known for voter suppression. And particularly this past week, we noticed the long lines of voters uh, who were, some of whom were unable to vote in uh, Georgia due to uh, faulty uh, equipment there. But let's talk about the movie. Well, the movie is 37 minutes long, and it's very engaging. Um, you can find a link to the movie and to the Zoom, uh, the link to join the Zoom meeting, in the uh, E-Chimes, which came out June 10th this week. And it will t teach you how you can uh, take action right from your own home to fight voter suppression and in this critical election year. We find, we think that it will leave you inspired and energized and determined to make a difference for our underrepresented voters. Uh, so we hope to see you there on the 28th. The, yes, it's June 28th, noon to one o'clock on Zoom, and you can look at the e chimes for the links. I hope you take a few minutes now to center yourself for worship as we join together in the uh, lighting of the community candle. Uh, knowing that uh, no matter where we are, uh, that we can light a candle, maybe light a candle in your own room, in your own home, uh, to uh, be connected to all the rest of us today. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself today, may this community be a place of companionship and healing for you. Rich or poor, gay or straight, homeless or housed, young or aging, full of hope or full of question. 
There is nothing that can separate us from God's all-embracing love. Christ invites you, Christ invites us, to find him today. Let the celebration begin. Friends, today is not only Youth Sunday, but it is Graduation Sunday, where we mark the occasion of those young people that are uh, advancing in their studies, that are graduating from high school, um, and that are going and doing amazing things. Uh, we have several graduates uh, in our congregation, um, and, we're, uh, and we've received some, a video from two of them. Uh, to let us know about uh, what is going on in their life, uh, uh, what thankfulness they have for the congregation, and just, it's an amazing video. I invite you uh, to, uh, to, see this, to see this video uh, from two of our graduates today. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so um, Jonathan asked us, uh, because we're graduating, to share some of our favorite memories and experiences with First Church. I feel like I'm automatically more awkward now that it's on. Um, so Your what demeanor we, has changed. So what do we remember about Indianola? Okay, one of the things that sticks out the most in recent years, nerds. Nerds, card games. I look forward to that every single year or every six months. I, I yeah, I look forward to losing to Julie. Um, you know, it, <laughs> that's a given. You have to have Julie there. To be the one who's gonna win, and then you know you can always hope. Because who ever gets second? Except yeah, you're, you're fighting yeah. for a second. You're never fighting for first. Because uh, if know. Julie's there, you know you're gonna lose. Speaking of the chocolate fountain. Mm, yep, Solenzino's uh, that again. Solenzino's always just uh, bringing it. Bring yeah. And, uh, not to bring up this, I feel like we're picking favorites, but um, <laughs> <laughs> when Mike would on the rope swing, you know, oh. the old rope, the, the, the good, the good rope, rope swing, swing um, the, you know, without the like harnesses or whatever. Yeah. When Yeah, and you, you know, when you're light enough and you just whip you down, you yeah. fly. That was, yeah, you know that was so good. Yeah, youngest ever remounter, and now it's torn down, so. No That's permanent. Title. Um, I have that forever, so. Yeah. Oh, that's a win in my book. And also, like, all of the Easter egg hunts. Easter egg. So. Those are so what, fun. What I remember liking was the first year I transitioned from finding the eggs to hiding the eggs. Yeah. I felt like a big kid. Right. Uh, that's like a rite of passage. I felt so cool. I have a lot of memories of choir because I stuck around for a little bit longer than this one. Yeah, I, well, because I started doing AV. 
Um, so I, I I was in choir for a few years, and then I then I started doing AV. So I had to. Um, well, I didn't have to, but uh, I chose to do AV instead. Yeah. Choir was choir was so fun. I remember being so excited for the moment in service where we would all run out and then be able to do our little our little singing. That's so fun. So yeah, I guess that's some of uh, our favorite memories of church. Um, I mean, there's more. Uh, we've been going to the first church since as long as I can remember. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess we'll move on to college because uh, I've heard you guys are interested in that. Um, I will be attending Western Washington University next year. Um, up in Bellingham, it's like Seattle but colder. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, my current plan is to study elementary education with the eventual goal of becoming an elementary school teacher. Um, so currently that's the plan. Um, I'm super stoked to go to Western, right in the mountains. Um, Bellingham's great. So I'm super stoked. Yeah, and I am going to be going to Washington State University. Um, as you can see, go Cougs. Oh, um, I was just—I was wearing this already. Uh, always, always repping the merch. Um, anyways, uh, so I'm—I'm I'm really, really excited. I am planning on majoring in psychology. Um, my goals for the future is possibly to go into UX design. I've always been really into art um, and design, that kind of thing. And so, hopefully, the career path I choose would uh, include that to some extent, and I'm really excited about going to Wazoo. It's a really, if you've never been there, it's in the middle of wheat fields, it's in the middle of nowhere, but the campus is incredible, um, and has tons of really cool programs, and I'm very, very excited. Anyways, uh, thank you First Church for being a really amazing community we've had the privilege of growing up in. Um, I guess as we move on to the next stage of our life, I think we're both excited. Um, yes. So, thank you for supporting us, and we'll be back for Christmas. Yes, so. so we'll see you all, and thank you all for being a very supportive community. I feel very lucky that I was able to grow up um, with all of you wonderful people around me. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Wow, that was, that was amazing. Uh, we certainly uh, want to celebrate Jefferson and Caroline as they uh, continue in their, in their lives, as they mark this occasion. And I invite you to do that, uh, not only by uh, sending uh, the Ashby family uh, uh, words of encouragement or support, uh, but also to join in this liturgy. I invite you to join with me on the bold type. God of truth and knowledge, by your wisdom we are taught the way and the truth. Bless now our graduates as they finish this course of study. We thank you for those who taught and worked beside them and all who supported them along the way. Walk with the graduates as they uh, move forward in life. Take away their anxiety and confusion of purpose. Strengthen their many talents and skills. Instill in them a confidence in the future you plan, where energies may be gathered up and used for the good of all people. For the graduates, this truly is a day of new beginnings, a time to remember and move on, and a time to believe what love is bringing. May they always know that Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do this is a day of new beginnings. Our God is making all things new. I invite you to celebrate with me, our graduates, in your own way, in your own homes, and uh, to be in prayer for them as they go through the next transition. Glory be to God. Amen. Please join me in prayer. I pray for everybody across the globe who has been affected by COVID-19. I pray for the safety of the protesters that march for equality. I pray for a country which is caught in a turmoil of unrest. I pray for the health and well-being of our first responders and health workers. I pray for the future of 2020's graduates who have worked so hard to be here. 
and I pray that our hardworking teachers and my fellow students get some well-deserved rest after a challenging year. A few words of introduction before the reading of Scripture today. For this Youth Sunday, the youth at First Church were polled and asked to uh, what they wanted as a sermon topic. None of them wanted to preach, but you've seen their leadership in other areas of the church worship today. And the vast majority of them responded and wanted a sermon on racism, on what racism uh, means to people of faith, Um, and what the Bible says and gives guidance. I'm thankful for their choice of topic and that the congregation gave me an extra week to think on what I wanted to say to our youth. The two readings for today are from the Old Testament book of Amos and the New Testament Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew, this is the Beatitudes, the blessed are the meek, the uh, the peacemakers, all those who seek peace. And Jesus names all these people because they are not all these blessings because people are not feeling them right now. They are not being experienced fully. So it would have been new and novel good news to them. It would have been a reframing of their struggles that they know in their heart are right, and yet they're hearing affirmation from someone uh, who is a direct conduit from God. It would have reframed what they were experiencing and helping them see the value of their thankless work. Blessings are like that, but it comes with a charge at the end to be salty. I know some of you might consider yourself saltier than others, but in this case, it means to keep persistent and to not rely on what old spice to do that new spice could do better. Keep on doing the work, not only for future blessings in heaven, but also for the benefit of all who are attracted to what you are working towards today. Finally, the prophet Amos. Amos yells a lot, has a lot of frustrations with the people. And in this passage, he names uh, what happens when people of faith hold uh, festivals um, in quiet spaces, kind of separate away from the crowds, instead of being at the rallies in solidarity with the marginalized, when religious people sit idly by while injustice is happening and swirling around us. It's a harsh word for today, read by such a great, kind student, but pay attention to the words and the meaning. I invite you to listen now as the children and youth lead us through the scriptures today. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of heavenly forces, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, God of heavenly forces, will be gracious to what is left of Joseph. Truly the Lord proclaims, the God of heavenly forces, the Lord. Crying will be heard in all the squares. In all the streets they will say, oh no, oh no. They will call upon the farmers to wail, and those skilled in mourning to lament. In all the vineyards there will be bitter crying, because I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your... entirely burned offerings and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your song. I won't listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a never-flowing stream.
When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and gives it light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable not to each other, but to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Words have changed their meaning over time. Uh, dapper used to mean heavy set, not how I would describe Paul Newman or Neil Patrick Harris. Heartburn used to mean jealousy. Inmate used to mean just housemate. Bully used to mean superb or wonderful. I guess it still does in England. A womb used to be referred to as the matrix. Maybe, maybe Morpheus was right. And awful used to mean commanding awe and majesty instead of what we call the year 2020. You probably have other examples, but words and their definitions should match so that we are using them correctly and we understand what each other mean. As a preacher, I also know to check Urban Dictionary and Twitter to make sure a word doesn't have other meanings than what I mean. This past week, a young African-American woman in Missouri, uh, Missouri, I'm an Oklahoman, Missouri graduate of Drake University in Iowa, wrote to Merriam-Webster Dictionary that they had a word wrong. The word was racism. Merriam-Webster defined racism as a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Whereas Kennedy Mitchum said that it should probably be something closer to, quote, racism is both prejudice combined with social and institutional power. It is a system of advantage based on skin color, not just a belief but a system. We need to, as people of faith, in a sermon about racism, start with the right definition and start with Scripture, seeing what racism looks like in the Bible before we can even begin to collectively respond to it in our streets today. The Bible has a lot of examples of prejudice, meaning to see someone as less than you, because their people are different than your people. Their tribe, often with skin color or practices, is different than your tribe. It means making judgment based on whose they are and not who they are. One example in scripture over and over again, there's a conflict between two groups of people, the Hebrews, uh, the Israelites, and the, the Sidonians. They were two people who started out as brothers. When Noah's family came out of the ark after 40 days um, in uh, uh, confinement, uh, uh, in uh, restrictions, uh, uh, Noah had a son named Ham who was kicked out of the family. So part of Noah's family became the Israelites, but Ham's kids became the Sidonians. They were literally brothers, nephews, cousins, but over and over again in scripture we see the Israelites hate the Sidonians so much ragging on them in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, three times in Ezekiel, just to be sure that you knew they were in conflict. 
When Jesus arrives on the scene and heads to the region called Sidon, which is where the hated Sidonians live, his fellow Israelites likely suspected he was going there to condemn people, but he wasn't. In Mark, Matthew, Luke, four times Jesus engages the Sidonians in friendly ways. And in one story, he heals a Sidonian instead of condemning them. In Matthew, Jesus even says, Sidon will be better off on the judgment day than my own tribe that rejects me. Over and over again, Jesus shows the Israelites that their feud with the Sidonians was wrong. Jesus tells us prejudice is wrong and unhelpful in ushering in the reign of God. It's important in those stories to always pay attention to who has power. In this case, it's the empire. Prejudice between marginalized groups benefits the empire as it uses its power to oppress. Jesus shows how it's time to let those old ways of tribalism go because all marginalized groups must stand together against the empire that wants to dominate them all. This is what we today call intersectionality. It means working together to understand one another, to let go of prejudices and determine solutions together. And it involves letting the empire know that we're onto them. Prejudice is when one group person or group sees another as less than. A person of any race or background can be prejudiced against any other person. Racism is when skin color privilege is combined with power that's used to oppress. And I'll tell you, this is Youth Sunday, and the youth know this. Our youth group is the most racially diverse group in the church. You youth know what prejudice is because most of you have lived it or seen your friends live it. You have stories, or you will, or pre of prejudice alive in your front of you. But too often, we think that this is all what racism is, prejudice, sin located in a human heart. If we convict human hearts to turn from prejudice, then we will solve racism. If we don't use racial slurs or tell racial jokes or have friends of different races, then we will solve racism. Much of Christian efforts is about this type of personal transformation, and it's an important step, but not the only step. The problem is, is that we can only deal with the sin that is visual to us. We can't deal with sin that is unseen, unexamined, either because privilege has sheltered us or because we weren't listening. So racism is about prejudice, but it's also about privilege. In the United States, this means white privilege, or the way society benefits white people because of the color of their skin, and not because of anything they've done uh, or or not done. To those of us who are white, it can feel invisible. Up until 1968, redlining was a legal practice in the United States, a government and real estate practice that allowed African Americans to live only in particular parts of town. Here's a census map of where African Americans lived in Seattle in 1960. You can kind of know the neighborhoods there. Madison Valley, all the way down Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, through the Central District to Judkins Park. And then it goes west to the Wing Luke Museum, named after the city councilor who fought against redlining and legislated for open housing. Because it doesn't directly affect people like me, white people can grow up not knowing anything about redlining, which is just one of just too many examples of systemic racism. Privilege is like water to a goldfish. You don't know you're in it until you've left it or until someone points it out. Privilege is like a credit card or a protective shield um, offered to us simply because we're male or educated or able-bodied or Christian or US citizens or because race is today's topic, white. Because of redlining, the white parts of town grew in value more than the black parts of town. So over the generations, white families have inherited hundreds of millions more in wealth than black Americans who weren't allowed to buy in those parts of town, creating a wealth gap between races that, aspect, that affects all aspects of our life today. Now let's focus on the third component, power. 
Racism comes into play when prejudice is combined with power, when systems are put into place that maintain advantages for one race over others, keeping the one race in power in power. It operates on institutional, individual, and cultural levels. It's about prejudice, privilege, power, which leads to oppression. And spoiler alert, the Bible is against oppression. You're a member of First United Methodist Church in Seattle. You know this from sermon after sermon, study after study, protest after protest. So prejudice plus privilege plus power is what's going on right now. When those combine to benefit men, it's called patriarchy. When those combine to benefit straight people, it's called heterosexism. And when it comes to race, prejudice, power, and privilege in America is white supremacy. The power to enact this privilege in terrifying systematic ways uh, that are prejudiced against a group of people for generations on end. I'm originally from Oklahoma, and 99 years ago this week in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, was the Tulsa Race Riots, where white looters and racists, enabled by the police force and city hall, burned down the black part of town, killed hundreds of people. Um, they found mass graves only years, just a few years ago, and eventually took much of that property away from its black owners. Greenwood was a neighborhood of affluent African Americans who thrived just a street down from poor whites who were jealous of their property, their houses, their close-knit culture, who themselves were a marginalized group who viewed another marginalized group as the cause of their oppression instead of the real culprit, which was the empire. It is not lost on me that Tulsa, the site of the race riot, is where the white, Supreme, uh, the white House has chosen to have a campaign rally on June 19th, a day known as Juneteenth, that celebrates the day in 1865 when news reached Galveston, Texas, that the Civil War had ended and that the enslaved African Americans were now free. It's also called Emancipation Day. A Make America Great Again rally held in Tulsa on that holiday we have to keep our eyes on the empire and let them know that we know what they're doing. But even opposing a manipulative campaign rally draws our focus away from where it should be because systemic racism is not limited to a political party. Michelle Alexander, in her uh, uh, introduction to A New Jim Crow, she wrote a new introduction 10 years later. She writes this, we cannot be seduced into believing that simply electing a different president or political party will necessarily free us from the history and cycle of creating caste-like systems of racial oppression in America. More is required of us in these times. We must build a movement of movements. I think of popular culture. Every dystopian novel and movie series has an empire that keeps their power by dividing others. In The Hunger Games, you have 13 districts divided uh, and competing against each other for the bread and circuses controlled by only one district. In scripture, the Pharisees inadvertently uh, prop up the empire by enforcing a purity culture that gives them power over the marginalized to separate them even further. So the powers of our country, uh, and sometimes our own faith, keep us from building a movement of movements. But, I'm, but today, we can turn and repent from that. So what can we do? The cause is so big that it can feel overwhelming, that it can feel paralyzing, but we can work on our part of it, where our expertise meets the need to think about where is it that you can affect change in your uh, circle of influence of people that look to you. For example, Charles Kim is now in Los Angeles helping persons of color with music projects so that they can get their voices out in this pandemic of COVID and racist violence. He's using his gifts to amplify others, and you can too. So what we do now is threefold. First way of support is to immerse yourself once a day into listening to those who are black, indigenous, and persons of color. Right now, in this moment, that means black women and men. 
I'm drawing this lesson from Monique Melton, an anti-racist educator on, on an Instagram post uh, uh, that you can find the link in the comments. Read the content, listen to the stories, not the ones found in dusty books from 20 years ago, those, those are valid, but from people on the ground right now, and su supplement your learning to be more actively supportive of the members of our congregation who are persons of color. Here's an example, and I'll use myself because that's the only experience I could speak with with authority. I was, uh, I'm learning to change my daily routines, and all it took was one experience. So first, Warner Brothers has made the movie Just Mercy, a biopic of the early days of civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson as he defended a death row inmate in Alabama in 1989, not that long ago. So Chelsea and I were watching it, talking after about the parts that were surprising to us. Uh, surprising to us. Second, flabbergasted by parts of the movie, I spent a few car rides listening to Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, with its 10-year in, um, introduction of, of how things have, have changed. And you heard me quote that earlier. Now I'm reading more, I'm making notes, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to make life changes, uh, and, and when I uh, put things out in public, sometimes I get called out or called in by my friends and colleagues when I live into the white privilege and racism that is fighting in my heart. But I keep coming back to the table even after messing up trying to learn to be a better public voice of anti-racism, following the lead of others, even in our own church, as I unearth my own implicit bias and the microaggressions. So the first call is twofold. Spend 15 minutes a day reading the Bible. I'm your pastor. Yep, 15 minutes a day. And 15 minutes a day watching and listening from voices uh, of today who are leading in, this, um, in dismantling racial structural violence. Intersectionality means learning from each other. To oppose the empire, and we can't do it in our own little bubbles. Can't find the time? Take 15 minutes off your lunch break to focus on anti-racist learning. Find the time. Lives depend on it, and you can increase both over time to 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, however you want to do it, because we need people who are spiritually grounded and politically aware of, what, of who is leading and how to support them. There are more resources in the comments. The second way is to support local organizations that are on the front lines locally. Uh, if, if you are a Seattle person, uh, Joey Lopez, a local organizer and friend of First Church, um, has shared some local organizations that are helpful. They are listed and linked in the comments. While it is important to support national movements, we follow the lead of persons of color in leadership locally. Every movement for equality is, is a sandwich. You know, policy reform at the top, practice reform at the bottom, hand in hand, working together. It's actually several sandwiches on top of each other because carving, one, one, carving out one locality where white supremacy has taken some hits, being squeezed out and, 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 and pushed back, leads to the next one until it truly reaches the power centers and affects global systemic change or national. So we're called to local support so that we can build on those gains locally uh, elsewhere. Third, is to dismantle the ways how policy changes elude persons of color. Uh, in just a few weeks, uh, there's a voter disenfranchisement forum uh, for, from Church and Society uh, with a great uh, special guest. Um, I hope you take a look at the thing in the comments. Friends, it is not enough to be not prejudiced you have to be anti-racist and work to dismantle white supremacy. It is not enough to feel guilty about participating in and benefiting from white supremacy. Don't waste time on guilt. and Keep learning and listening. It is not enough just to attend a justice-focused church. We have to be a justice-focused church. We cannot think our saltiness and other areas of justice work creeps into this one. We have to be salty all the time, all the ways in intersectional good work. The good news is, is that you are not alone. You have a community and a God who are with you and a Christ whose teachings help you self-reflect and recognize systems of oppression. The cure to this contagion 
is persistence. It's about not losing focus. The scripture today from Amos about justice rolling down like an ever-flowing stream comes after after Amos says that God hates our festivals and sacrifices. Right now, God hates this worship? No, God hates, God's vision is when we hold distractions or celebrations that do not acknowledge and commit ourselves to change. That's what I'm inviting you to do now, to help with the good work of carving out places, local and global, about stepping out and stepping back for some of us as we do this work of mutuality. And in closing, it's about looking people in the eye. You've probably seen this image on social media. It was shot by Grace Jensen of a confrontation between an angry white objector to a Black Lives Matter peaceful protest and an African-American woman named Samantha Francine. She wrote on social media what led to this moment. She says this, As a child, I grew up with a single white father who was originally from Chicago. He taught us from a young age that things were going to be different for us just because of the color of our skin. One of the things he used to remind us constantly was that, quote, no matter the threat, always look them in the eye. So they have to acknowledge you are human. She says, when I lifted up my glasses, he, the protester, saw me, and I saw him. He was acting out of fear, I know that. I hold no malice in my heart for this man. I hope this moment will soften him. I hope he will be changed. But even if he isn't, I am. Yes, I had power that day, but I couldn't have done it without all of the courageous people around me. We are stronger, united, and in this moment, I felt that. That is a call to action if I've ever heard one. We are called to look people in the eye and ourselves in the mirror and remind people of their and our humanity and to do the personal work on breaking systems of oppression that turn us, uh, turn us against each other. Prejudice, privilege, and power fall short of persistence and the people, and I would add the panuma, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. We are easily distracted, we can forget, but the spirit keeps us moving forward, keeps us salty, keeps us blessing one another so that we might bless further. My hope is that the youth of today continue this persistence, and we don't have to wait. It can happen today. Glory be to God. Amen. Please join in the Lord's Prayer in whatever language or translation you find comfortable, or join with me on the words on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in our closing hymn, The Words Will Appear on on the screen in a moment.
We are not made powerless before evil. We need not cower or turn away. The Spirit of Christ sends us to live out the good news. God equips us. God enables us. God empowers us. May our shared longing for justice be a source of strength and hope in times of trouble. Go in peace and welcome the presence of God.